Hey, Auto Walksman, how you doing? Matt Daniel. I'm doing fine, Matt. Uh, lovely to be here. I'm excited to, to talk with y'all and learn more and, and about VMI. So, and it's good to, good to see you too. Um, today is the, and I'll introduce who Auto is here in a second for the people who are watching, but today is the beginning of early voting, I think. It's the 17th of September uh, in the morning, and I, you know things are starting to happen. Is that right? That is absolutely right. Yes, sir. So wh what do you think about early voting? I, I'm kind of mixed on early voting. Uh, I'm not one to say that the, there's a lot of voter integrity issues, although I think there could be. Uh, September 17th through October 30th is a long time for a campaign to try to monitor uh, people who are going into uh, the, the registrar's office to vote. Uh, I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative. Uh, my background is I really feel more of election day is the day. Uh, for a candidate to try to run a campaign a month and a half in advance, it, it does create quite a few uh, difficulties. I mentioned one about monitoring the polls is one, uh, but you're, a lot of the campaigns really haven't started. Uh, we, you know, we just had the first, you know, we had a governor's debate last night late, and here like 12 hours later, we're already, you know, people are going to be making the decision on who they're going to elect for governor when the campaigns have got a lot more information to put out to to learn about their candidates as well as the opposition as well too. Yeah, but it's a necessary evil right now. It's the law, I guess. It's the it's the process we're following. And um, I, I got a phone call from, uh, and I'll do an intro to what we're doing right now here in a second. But early voting is important, and it's probably uh, if uh, if it's not the most important, then it is one of the most important things that we're trying to get across to people who are watching this video, regardless of which side you vote on is to use the process and get it out there early because if you don't the other side will and they'll take advantage of that and so i got a, a phone call from glenn yunkin of all people uh a few weeks ago who you know thanked me for the stuff that we're doing with the interviews with the house delegate candidates uh, but also asking me to try to reinforce that early voting while not being something we're used to is something that at least for this cycle we have to embrace Absolutely. We've done our research and actually my daughter and I are going to try to catch up with each other uh, after we finish the Zoom call and, and we both know who we want to vote for. So we'll be going to the courthouse sometime between now and lunchtime and, and, and taking care of that so we can focus more on the campaign. Well, well, yeah, that, that, that's good. And I'm hoping to get uh, to get that done early today or, you know, I guess I've got till uh, till uh, November 2nd to do it. But it helps to uh, help you and people like you, candidates like you, manage your campaign when you see who has voted, their historical voting record, and uh, allows you then to uh, adjust your approach to the remainder of the campaign is what I understand. So yeah. and things have gotten pretty sophisticated these days. But let's not uh, dwell on that too much. Um, uh, my name is Matt Daniel. I'm the chairman of the Spirit of VMI. VMI, the Spirit of VMI Political Action Committee. We're basically chartered to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, stand watch, uh, be the sentinel over uh, over VMI with regards to uh, legislation and legislators. We just founded in uh, in March of this year uh, because there was a need. We should have had this 20 years ago. I think maybe we would not have gotten into the mess that VMI has gotten into over the last uh, nine uh, to 12 months, <clears throat> if we had had uh, a party that or a body that was standing watch uh, to, uh, to help support legislators that are friendly and hold accountable legislators uh, that, is, that are not friendly toward VMI, very common sense issues. And today we're talking with uh, Otto Waxman. Otto is the House of Delegates candidate for the 75th district. Uh, can you explain that district for me, Otto? Yeah, geographically, I think it's like the second largest house district in the state, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it covers quite a bit of area. Uh, the city of Franklin, uh, the counties of Southampton, Sussex, Greensville, uh, the city of Emporia, uh, Brunswick County, and a portion of the eastern part of uh, Lunenburg, half the Kenbridge area and the Dundas area. It's a large district of uh, I, I ran in 2019, got within 2%. That was the first time I ran. I was running against a 14-year incumbent at the time. Now she's a 16-year incumbent. Uh, for me to have done that as the first time two years ago, got within 2%. Uh, we really amazed a lot of people. Nobody thought that I would get that close. 
I've been campaigning ever since 2019. It is not uncommon now for me to drive five and a half hours to campaign a day and not leave my district. It's, it's a big area. Yeah, I was looking at the map. You know, we endorsed the uh, auto back about a month ago in the, in, in mid August, and uh, in doing that, we did research on. And I'm 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 happy to finally be able to get you in this uh, in this interview series, uh, Otto. But look, just looking at the the mass uh, square miles in that district, it's a, it's amazing. Uh, it's, uh, south of Petersburg, I drive down 95 to go down to uh, the Outer Banks or or, or further down the uh, North Carolina coast and would pass through Emporia. Um, and so I'm relatively familiar and I've got really good friends who live just east of Emporia, you know, sort of a peanut farmer type of people who, mm -hmm. who are down there, who, who, by the way, support you. So that's, uh, that's good. But I was just impressed by the mass square mileage of the, uh, of the area. Yeah. Um, so who are you running against? Rosalind Tyler. And she's been there how long? 16 years now. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe we'll uh, get to some discussion about uh, about your stance versus their stance. This being a decision aid, um, we are uh, you know it'd be good to sort of show uh, um, foil one against the other to, to to for any undecided people to vote on, on where uh, you may sit in public safety, economy, right to work. Um, uh, education and a couple of other cats and dogs uh, from there. We've done these interviews for a bunch of candidates so far. Gina Ciarcia from the second up in Northern Virginia, Jason Ballard out near uh, Blacksburg in Giles County, JD Maddox in Alexandria, Mike Cherry, who is probably just to the north of you in the 66th, um, uh, Mary Margaret Castleberg in the uh, in Rico County, Richmond area, West Side. I think 73rd, Tara Durant back up in Northern Virginia, Mark Early uh, in, the, uh, in the Richmond area again, Tim Anderson, Virginia Beach, Glenn Davis, Virginia Beach, and, uh, and we have plans to get Chris Holmes and, uh, and possibly uh, Ronnie Campbell, Chris Holmes from the Richmond area, Henrico as well, and Ronnie Campbell from Rockbridge County uh, area as well on these. So I really appreciate you spending time and helping us build our book of those candidates who are willing to talk with us about issues that we hope we can get out to the voting public. And then a little hook toward the end that we talk about some DMI stuff to see what, where you stand on some, some DMI stuff. Certainly. So uh, if, if you don't mind, we'll go straight to, uh, this has been a long preamble and I'm sorry for that, but um, uh, public safety in, uh, in, your, in your district. Uh, so I'll just, you know, what's the current status of, of, uh, of crime in the 75th right now. I'm sure maybe it's all over the map, but maybe you can describe it better for me. Well, it, it's kind of difficult because it's so rural. We just don't hear a lot of, about crime and safety. But when you start looking at statistics, although we may not actively have a lot of cases, we do have a few cases. And a couple of areas of, of importance are uh, uh, the city of Franklin and Emporia. Uh, because we're so rural, when we do have something, as I've said, it becomes a much higher. And I believe that those two areas are like in the top 10 for personal and person crime in the state. Uh, we're uh, a large agricultural area, uh, but those few things that we do have really do hit the top of the charts. Yeah, and so I imagine any of the, um, since it's not a, that big of an issue with you in the district, though you would be, I'm sorry, Matt, I think I lost you. Uh, impacts how the state handles crime and, and handles public safety issues. I mean, one of those public safety issues came up uh, in a conversation I was having this morning with one of, uh, one of our uh, committee members, one of our executive committee members in the spirit of VMI. We're, we're just you know, talking about things that are issues. And one of those things is parole board issues that uh, came out. And uh, I, you're familiar with the parole board releases of, I think it's been, you know, uh, eight violent criminals. Yes. Uh, and, and the lack of support or lack of um, indictment by the current attorney general. And then, you know, and, and no pressure by the House of Delegates to have the attorney general uh, address that. What do, you, what do you think about the, about the parole board issue? And is it something that you've thought about at all? 
Oh, I, I thought about it. I think it's actually atrocious. I, I thought about it more a year or two ago when it was starting to happen. Uh, everything that I'm seeing and reading, they're just flat violating the rules. They weren't uh, letting the localities know when they were releasing these individuals. Some of these were very violent uh, victims. I think uh, Jason Mayerez does an excellent job talking about it when, when he campaigns. Uh, we've known of several uh, really violent criminals who've been released only to commit more criminal activities in the, the, you know, soon after they were released to, to have more victims. Uh, I was talking with, uh, at a meeting with Carl Leonard, Sheriff, uh, not too far from here, and something that I had not been aware of that they had passed a law that gives the criminals more time off for good behavior from just a few days a month to, I think he said, 15 days a month. And he expects when that goes into effect, they postpone it till 2022, uh, he's looking at releasing hundreds of, of inmates from his facility, and, and that's one small county. Um, that I, I see that as a huge problem throughout the state. I'm not sure how they're going to monitor and handle that. Uh, I, having said that, though, I do uh, support law enforcement. Uh, uh, my, one of the things that you mentioned, my opponent, Rosalind Tyler, she has been voting to strip away qualified immunity, and I don't understand how law enforcement officers can possibly uh, continue to do their job if they're they're worried about losing all their personal possessions as part of their job. I, I was a small business owner, owned a pharmacy for 18 years, and I would not expect my employees to to lose their life savings based upon a decision they were making for me. Does that go hand in hand with uh, the defund the police um, uh, topic? Yes, I think right. it so does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, often I've thought school teachers and law enforcement officers were two of the people that the society seems to undervalue for the impact they have on our kids and protecting us in society. I've always, I've often thought that they've already been underpaid. And now the discussion of defunding and stripping away qualified immunity, that is a tremendous morale issue with the officers that, that I come in contact with. I uh, recently got the endorsement of the Police Benevolent Association uh, spoke to them afterwards. Uh, when I started uh, really getting into the campaign cycle about six months ago, I was told there was like 250 open spots with state police. And now I'm hearing there's 400. Uh, a lot of that I have the feeling they're attributing to the defund the police, the get rid of qualified immunity. Uh, every profession or organization is going to have a certain percentage of people that need to be weeded out. But when you take away money, you take away the immunity, I see those good law enforcement officers getting employed elsewhere, and we're going to be left with a much bigger problem. It seems to me like that's designed to create a much bigger problem than, than what they're trying to root out right now. Well, I thank you for going into depth in that, uh, in that, in that answer. We'll move on to a different topic, but uh, okay. that let, lets us know pretty much where you stand with regard to, uh, to public safety. How about economy? Uh, in the in the 75th. Can you give me a real quick sketch uh, economic profile of the uh, of the district? Uh, the economy of this big agricultural area, there were a few big businesses like in Franklin, there was a, if Paul D, uh, there was Camp Mill that was bought it by IP that was closed. Uh, so that was a tremendous hit to that area. Uh, the town of Lawrenceville had St. Paul's College that had a lot of activity. W when that closed, that negatively impacted that area. Uh, we've got I-95 running straight through the middle of our district, yet it seems like uh, due to the infrastructure of the highways, they bypass most of our towns and cities. So we have a huge unemployment problem. That's only been exacerbated by the uh, unemployment situation. We've got business owners that can't staff their businesses because they can't find people to work right now. They're, they're, it's so easy to get unemployment and with the kickers that they were getting, we've had restaurants close just because of the unemployment situation right now. So you had businesses that had closed, not only businesses that have been ignored due to infrastructure that has ignored the towns and cities in your district, but you have had businesses that have closed because of the, 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 the recent uh, virus stuff? Or yeah, due well, to like a prime example is the uh, uh, Davis Travel Plaza on 95. They, they employ probably more employees in my county than anybody else. Well, once the unemployment benefits kicked in, he, uh, the owner there pretty much immediately had to close Denny's because he couldn't find the employees. 
he, re he deployed the ones that were still working to the other restaurants. They've got like a Popeye's, a Subway, uh, Wendy's. And even with those employees being sent to the other locations, they have uh, had to reduce their hours twice that I know of. Uh, like Starbucks used to be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Then it was just open 24 hours on weekends. And I, I think that they've had to curtail that now as well too. And the, the, when I talked to the, the owner about it, he said something that stuck with me. He said, when is the state going to stop holding our employees hostage? You know, they were making so much money. He think he figured like 15 or $16 an hour with the unemployment kicker at the time. And those restaurants, they just can't afford that much that their business can't handle it. You know, that they, they were going, they were losing money trying to pay people that much. Right. And, and, and you know, that's not, that, that can't last. No, it can't last. The benefits can't last. And then, so there, then there's no jobs to come back to. Yeah. Well, not only that, but I think that the billions of dollars that the federal government gave the state, it's my understanding that none of that money was spent to try to replenish that unemployment, you know, line item. So I was hearing that the plan was to tax the small businesses more to fill up the gap, to fill in those unemployment dollars. That, like and it's, said, that it's makes it's not sustainable. That makes me mad. That makes me mad. So what, what do you what do you think that you as delegate can do to to, to mitigate that? Stop that. I, change it. I'm, yeah, I'm a, I'm a conservative. I think that that whole thing needs to be looked at, redone and corrected. I mean, it's. I, I don't see how the economy can continue the way it is. You know, we're looking at high inflation right now with the price of gas and, and food. Uh, and I, I really think that we need to buckle down and, and really come up with a plan that, that works with this. Since, since your district doesn't have a lot of big businesses and union jobs, I would imagine, unless you tell me differently, right to work probably is not a, as big a, an issue with, with you down in the 75th. But as a voting delegate, you, you would have the ability to uh, try to protect the right to work clauses that Virginia has that make Virginia or should make Virginia a great place for small businesses to uh, to move to and or continue to uh, thrive in. Do you have any commentary about right to work? Well, actually, right to work can play a role because we have so few jobs here. A lot of the people here do go outside the district to get jobs to some of the plants and in Hopewell, Chesterfield, those types of areas. So it can be, uh, but I'm, I mentioned I'm a small business, was a small business center, owned a pharmacy for 18 years. Uh, Virginia's had, you know, the number one rating, the place to do a business in the country. And I really accredit that to the right to work bill. I, I think that's what makes Virginia such an attractive place for these places to come and, and do their business and, and have their employees. Yeah, you know, along with the public safety stuff, some of the education stuff, and of course the VMI stuff, those are things that I, uh, we would ask people who that we support try to uh, defend those um, and or vote the, the right way to protect those, uh, those capability, those um, uh, characteristics of Virginia's um, uh, political scene, I should, you know, yeah. maybe a good way to put it. It's, it's uh, been working, why break it? <laughs> yeah, right, right. It was tried. They tried and was a 2020, right, with uh, mm -hmm. with a bill that was introduced by, you know, uh, those two guys. Right. OK. OK. Well, I'm glad that that didn't take hold and hopefully we can uh, we can maintain it. Do you think that that's under fire? Yes, I, I expect it is. It's, it's, you know, one of the questions we get asked at every election cycle and depending on who's in control, they, they tend to want to get rid of the right to work in Virginia. OK. So on to education. Education, you know, it's a firebrand issue these days and made sort of national uh, education in Virginia uh, uh, a, a national topic through what's going on up in uh, up in Loudoun County. Do you see any of that uh, stuff, the creeping in of uh, alter alternative curriculum and, and, and changed curriculum in in uh, in the Frank in the. Uh, 75th schools. I imagine you have a couple of different school districts in your. The 75th district, I haven't heard of it yet. But to me, though, it's, I don't know if it's because it's not there or the parents just haven't found out about it. Uh, keep in mind that the county that I'm in is, was one of the last counties to put a plan together to get the kids back to school, uh, which is 
I've also been an educator. I was on faculty at Shenandoah University for seven years, uh, but the only time that I didn't live in the district. And, and I understand how important it is, particularly for, for kids in the early years to have that face-to-face -face contact. And I think that we've got a lot to catch up those kids with that lost education. Uh, but one of the counties immediately uh, to the east of ours, Isle of Wight County, there has been an awful lot of discussion about critical race theory, equity type of issues. They brought in a, a critical race person who was the parents were told was just supposed to uh, be helping train the faculty. And then later they found out that they were actually teaching classes and had modified uh, the curriculum with critical race theory. And that, that is a huge issue for some of those parents in Isle of Wight understand. In this election cycle, are there um, are there uh, boards, the school board members being elected or reelected on on the ballot with the, you know on your ballot? Most of the counties in our area, as far as I know, are elected except for one, Southampton. They are appointed, and that's been a big contention. There've been some petitions to try to get Southampton County board members elected instead of appointed. So far, they've been unsuccessful in doing that, but I have a feeling they're going to be working harder on it. Right. So what I'm getting at here is the down ballot issues of people really, and I'm guilty of this until just recently, um, not really paying that much attention to what goes on down to, at the molecular level uh, of the local jurisdictions and districts and, uh, and, and school districts, you know, from, from the local bills. Uh, and or state uh, bills that may be introduced to uh, to school board um, members who are on the ballot to be elected. So, I, I, and this maybe this isn't so much a question other than a, a statement and admission by me uh, that I had not in the past paid much attention to the lower part of the of the uh, of the ballot. But that's probably uh, it, it, we should probably move that to the top part of the ballot. Yeah. Uh, and it's probably the most important part of the ballot because it's the stuff that you can affect uh, every day. It, it is very, very important. Unfortunately, because of COVID, they really haven't been doing any candidate forums here. Uh, two years ago when I ran, they were doing candidate forums. I got to meet a lot of the people running for school board issue. There was much debate about that. I'm not sure of any counties that are running school board elections right now. I could okay. be mistaken about that. I've been so focused on the 75th that I've not, but I, I learned a lot of information with the candidate forms two years ago. One of the, the, the counties in my district, uh, the person running for school board mentioned the fact that like 40% of the FTE teaching hours were done by substitute teachers that didn't necessarily have any teaching credentials. Uh, she was pitching that that was an, uh, one of the ways that that county was uh, offsetting their budget shortcomings which seems like they were shortchanging the, the educators in that county. Uh, right. We've also got a lot of old school buildings that need to be replaced as well too. But the, our, our you know, sparsely populated areas with one of the lowest economic outcomes in the state, our counties don't have the money by themselves to build these new schools. In Brunswick County, they're looking at a $55 million project uh, their proposal at first was to increase some of their taxes 62%. These localities can't afford to replace these expensive buildings like that with, with, with their tax base. Well, thanks for the added detail uh, on that. Move to uh, quickly, and this would just be a one question thing, I think, but uh, <clears throat> voter integrity has been an issue regardless of what's going on and what your opinions of what, is, what has gone on in the nation nationwide. Uh, and statewide elections in the past. Um, do you think that it is a fair uh, assumption that voter identification should be required for voting? I believe it is. I mean, when I registered to vote the first time, I got a, a voter ID card. Anytime I need uh, another one, I can contact the registrar. I'll get one in a couple of days. I don't see that as an economic uh, barrier uh, to, to voting. I think that everybody needs to be assured that we have uh, elections that are secure and the outcome is that everybody can believe in. Uh, I, I think that we really need to make sure that we've got the right people voting. Right. I mean, it's been trotted out as a uh, discrimination factor. And um, I mean, it, it's, it's insulting to all people to assume that they can't find their way 
to getting uh, some uh, valid form of voter identification um, ridiculous. So thank, I mean, thanks for that answer. There's um, so many less important things that we require an ID than to make sure we've got the right person voting. Right. <laughs> I know it's, it's almost funny. You know, you could make cartoons about this all day long if you could get them in the paper, you know. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, do you find that in the 75th, you guys have a big division, a, a schism uh, between uh, liberal and conservative, left and right, uh, Democrat, Republican? And, and is it hostile, you know, across the nation, it's become dangerous. It's become, you know, to be a part of the other party and or a part of the other way of thinking. Do you find that in your district at all? In our district, it's rural. I think we've been uh, used to coming together to, to, to overcome different obstacles and difficulties. I don't see it on the surface as much, but, and, in, in, you know, when you scratch the surface, it's there. And I, I really think that social media has been playing a part in that too. You know, if I'm a conservative and I go to conservative sites, social media pushes me conservative values. If, if I were a liberal and went to liberal sites, social media would push me things that were valued liberally. And I, I think that that's playing a role in, in driving a wedge between us right now. There's, there's not the realization for even the two political parties that seems to come together to get what's best for the citizens of the Commonwealth. I think that that's really the, the worst thing that I've seen happen in our political structure in the last few years. You think there's any hope, any way we can fix it? I'm hoping it is. I'm hoping enough people will realize that that's a problem and, and then run for office. It's one of the reasons that I feel I need to run. In 2019, I saw that was happening. Uh, and then when the House and the, the Senate flipped uh, and there was basically one party rule in the state, uh, I went and sat in the galley and, and watched what was going on, and it was appalling. It was so different than what I witnessed in the 80s when I was uh, helping with Delegate Harvey Morgan out of Gloucester. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping, you know, that there's a way that uh, sanity can prevail uh, over this division that we have in the, in the country. I do think it's dangerous, and it's certainly not healthy, if not to go so far as say it's a uh, it's dangerous, but uh, it's certainly not healthy for the for the country. Um, I'll move on to the uh, the VMI stuff, and, and you know, basically, I could sum this up by saying that the VMI mission statement um, is uh, has been not so much the big mission statement per se, but that the products of the mission statement have been under fire uh, of late. Um, we, we stand as a spirit of VMI to caution against the uh, curriculum and process uh, changes <clears throat> and doctrine changes uh, that would threaten the very uh, components of the, of the VMI mission statement. And those components, I'll read to you real quickly. So, you know, paraphrasing a bunch, leaving out a bunch, and then pulling out advocates of the American democracy and free enterprise system ready as citizen soldiers to defend their country in time of national peril. BMI shall provide a qualified, to qualified young uh, women and men, undergraduate education of the highest quality, embracing engineering, science, and the arts conducted in and facilitated by the unique BMI system of, uh, of military discipline. So the, the components that I, we're really uh, addressing here are the, the uh, unique system of military discipline and then the uh, free enterprise system uh, that is part of the mission statement. It's a bold mission statement to actually say that. And, and you know, it's, we should say that and we should uh, uh, promote that. Um, the, what we're concerned about and what we're standing watch against are curriculum changes and or infrastructure and this, uh, uh, doctrine changes that would introduce things like critical race theory and uh, other racist uh, paradigms that would challenge the free enterprise system uh, uh, per se, uh, and, and introduce a different way of, uh, of approaching how business is done. Uh, and, and it should be based on race and not by your quality of your, of your character uh, or uh, meritocracy. So we think that that is an issue, and it's one of the reasons why we formed, is that uh, uh, we want to be fair, and we want to be equality-minded, but not necessarily equity-minded. And there's a big difference between those two 
concepts. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, under fire has been uh, the, the system of military discipline at DMI, sort of the uh, crucible, you could think of it, it's sort of the boot camp uh, of, uh, of uh, VMI, uh, where there's a rat line, uh, which is the freshman experience uh, at, at VMI, and then there's the honor code uh, that holds uh, cadets accountable to not lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. And our way of thinking that we, we wish that was more uh, available and, uh, and present in more institutions of higher learning, not fewer and not watered down. Uh, but that has, though both those institutions are potentially or have been under fire and or potentially in the future. Um, the, the data bears out that VMI is one of the highest net present value schools in the nation. And there's a bunch of different stats that, that uh, I don't bore you with too much, but as you stand on the floor, in the House of Delegates, when you're uh, asked to uh, to promote or defend uh, a, a bill that would affect VMI uh, in a in a positive way, we will certainly feed you any uh, data so that you can make up your own mind how to vote on those things. So all this said, all this you know preamble said for the VMI stuff, um, uh, would you support? Um, uh, uh, monetary appropriations, the appropriate appropriations uh, for VMI uh, as your delegate standing in the House. Well, certainly, as, as long as the budget will, will you know, afford it, it kind of depends on what the economic environment of the state is at the time. But I certainly recognize that that VMI has, and how, has provided some outstanding products who've become leaders in the country and in the world. Uh, you mentioned the mission, state, mission statement. I think that's very important. Uh, and it mentions free enterprise. Part of that is your mission statement is basically your brand. This is what we're, we're looking to do. Uh, and, and the students that want to come there attract, that's free enterprise. You're marketing. This is what we want to do. And, and those students are applying there knowing what the product is. Uh, and I, I, I applaud the discipline that VMI has. Uh, I went to William and Mary. We had a an honor code too, and, and you're right. I think that as I look around at some of the products that some of the colleges are putting out there and some of the curriculum, I, I applaud VMI for not diluting or reducing what their goals are in their, in their final product. It is not for everybody, but people that apply there should know what they're applying for. And, and those that want that extra discipline, I think VMI is a great place for it. it it's a unique opportunity. I appreciate that. My wife went to William & Mary also, so you guys might have been classmates um, okay. as well. Um, well, well, thank you for that. Um, so we'll, we'll close this up. Uh, and I've, I've taken a lot of your time on uh, voting day number one, and I, I, I appreciate you giving us this time. Do you have any save rounds, any, uh, oh, by the way, is any, I'm going to do this on the first day sort of uh, uh, comments you want to make, messages you want to give? Just that I look at the state and I'm in a very rural district and I, I firmly believe that I need to seek out other delegates and representatives from rural districts because our whole rural traditional lifestyle, uh, whether it be hunting or shooting or things like that, is definitely under the attack of people in the more populated areas of the state that don't understand our traditional values and they, they discounted them much like maybe VMIs under a lot of criticism from outside forces that don't understand what VMI does. And, and we need to begin to realize that other people in different areas have needs that are different than, than where they are from. And, and, and we really need to stand up for rural values is, is what I, I feel one of my main concerns needs to be for the 75th district. We need to fight well, for our people. We need to get some pride back. Well, it's been, it's, it's been a pleasure talking with you. It's such a, uh, a well-grounded and common sense approach to, to getting things done. Um, and, the, and, the, and the difference between you and your opponent, I would encourage anybody who's listening to this, and, and we will try to get this out to people in your district and certainly people in the VMI family, uh, to go out, vote early. Uh, if you happen to be in or know someone in the 75th district, that's the south side. How do, you, do you actually call it Southern Virginia or Virginia's south side, or is there a, like a little catchphrase for it? 
uh, well, they call it South Side, but South Side is broad. It actually goes through three different districts, and, and we kind of use the moniker of South Side, but also the people further west of it's considered South Side as well too. We're, we're kind of the, the part of the state that doesn't get a lot of respect or attention. We, we, we really need to change that. Some people say it's not the end of the world. You can see it from there. Totally joking, but but unfortunately, that's how some some of us feel that we're left behind. <laughs> and, and 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 we need to, you know, every county in our district has lost population this, this census, and and we definitely need to turn that around. We need to get the pride back in the seventy fifth. That, that, that's that, a great as, as we say, we need a new prescription for South Side. <laughs> <laughs> no, well spoken from the pharmacist. Um, vote early. Uh, vote for Otto Waxman in the 75th. We've endorsed Otto from the spirit of VMI. Can you tell me that VMI is good? I know it's a silly, you know, little statement, but it means a lot to us. If you say VMI is good, that helps us. Oh, VMI is good. I, I have absolute respect for for what VMI is trying to do. It's 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 wonderful to keep those high standards where they need to be. Thank you very much, sir. I, I will shut off the recording value of, of this uh, uh, of this interview. I appreciate it, and stay on just for a second, and uh, and we'll close up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.